Hello and welcome to Cody and Corbin have a podcast, the show where two former roommates and they were roommates. talk about a new movie every week. This week on the show, we're talking about Goodwill Hunting. The most gifted mind to ever enter its classrooms. Well, this is correct. Who did this? Is the person who cleans its floors. Well, I just need the name of this guy who works in my building. Got this job through his PO, you can call him. PO? Parole officer. Meet Will Hunting. I've been looking over this rap sheet of yours. Assault, theft, resisting. I've spoken to the judge, and he's agreed to release you under my supervision. Really? You have to meet with a therapist every week. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> For the first time in his life, he's about to meet his match. How many shrinks you go to before me? Five. <laughs> I'm your host, Corbin Zavokal. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Cody Webb. Cody, do you like apples? I want to start. I actually don't like apples. So, oh, well, okay. stuff, yeah. but uh, yeah, man, excited to be here. Hell of an intro from you. Going to be a good episode, I think. And uh, we got a great guest today. Uh, I'm being very sarcastic when I say that, but uh, he picked a good movie at least. So I respect that. Well, it's uh, episode 20 and back for the fourth time on the Jeez. podcast. We have Jake Ross. Jake, it's not your fault, buddy. Welcome to the show. How are we doing? Thank you. I'm uh, doing very good. Went to the gym today. You know, I hit chest on Mondays. Been a pretty good day, but doing pretty good. I'm unemployed right now, so I don't really <laughs> have much to do. So, understandable feeling. Uh, before we get into Goodwill Hunting and and why Jake picked the movie, like we did last episode, Pride Month, going to be suggesting some films to check out. First one is this movie called The Watermelon Woman, which is on Showtime if you have that. Um, I think you can also rent it a couple different places. It's this really interesting movie because it's about, it's it's almost like semi-autobiographical. It's like this Cheryl Dune, who is like the first black lesbian to ever like direct a movie by herself. And she's basically making this movie about herself where she like works in this video store where she's then trying to make a documentary documentary documentary. What? <laughs> she's, try- <laughs> not going well. she's trying to make a documentary about the watermelon woman and this idea of, you know, the way black women were often portrayed in early film. The other movie I'll give you is the imitation game. Basically Benedict Cumberbatch is playing this, you know, Alan Turing, who is a gay scientist in the uh, 1940s who ended up dying because it was illegal to be gay. And he, killed himself rather than having to undergo the medical treatments that the English were placing upon him. But he was a World War II hero, and it's a pretty good movie. So check that out. Those are my picks. Now let's move over to Goodwill Hunting. Jake, why'd you pick the movie? Why? 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 Well, it's easy because it's my favorite movie of all time. It's the best movie of all time. Now, see, when I was about 14 or 15, I saw it. I saw it Matt Damon. And, you know, 14 and 15-year-olds, they pay attention to Rotten Tomatoes scores. This has a 97%. So I was like, hey, this seems pretty good. But I didn't watch it because I thought it was about actual hunting. And I wasn't interested in that. So a few years later, in about 2016, I think was the first time I watched it. I watched it. You know, I was pretty sad in high school, so I felt like I uh, felt like I um Connected to it. Identified. Identified as well. So after I watched it, I started watching a bunch of Matt Damon movies, Born Trilogy. You know, he became my favorite actor of all time. Ben Affleck was okay. <laughs> uh, you know, anybody that knows me knows it's my favorite movie of all time. I'm kind of making my personality trait. How many times do you think you've seen this movie? At least 20. Jesus. Is it still uh, like as good as it was the first time you saw it? Or no. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I will. I will say with this movie, it is, an ext- it is an extremely rewatchable movie. It is not like it's never a chore when you have to watch this movie. Like even though I probably have seen this movie in the last twelve months, even though we're doing the podcast, it's it's still just a joy to sit down and rewatch. Uh, watching it last night before the podcast was my third time watching it just this year. So. Might be a little excessive. We're only Let's halfway go. through the year, bro. <laughs> Not even. <laughs> let's uh let's get into our initial thoughts. Good morning, Vietnam. Cody, why don't you uh hit us? Yeah, I'll kick us off here. Um, I don't remember how many times I've seen this movie. I'd say probably like five, six. Um, which I feel like it's a decent amount. 
Um, yeah, I mean, off the bat, I, I do agree a lot with, with Junior here. I don't think we're going to be arguing a ton about this movie. Uh, I'd probably put it in my top 10 of all time. Uh, number one is obviously a little steep, but definitely one of my personal favorites. Uh, and yeah, I mean, my initial thoughts, the first thing off the bat, which, you know, I think I like about a lot of other movies as well, is it's super quotable. It's super memorable. Uh, my boy's wicked smart. Love that. Any like Boston accent movie, we were doing this with The Departed as well. I could just like rattle off like 20 lines from the movie. Uh, obviously, how you like them apples? I mean, when I when I first time I saw this movie, I thought that was you know the greatest line of all time. <laughs> um, and then as well as the end. It's a very you you line, Cody. It's it a, is it's it, something it we would so like. Hard. But uh, as well as the end, son of a bitch stole my line. Uh, I think that's my favorite line of the entire movie. But I mean, not even written in the script, ad lib yeah, by Rod, yeah. Robin Williams. Okay, like great, uh, rip. But uh, yeah, in general, I mean, this script is pretty untouchable. I think um it, it's up there with me for like moonlight and, and some of the other ones we've raved on a bunch in the past it's it's kind of just like every conversation is like genuinely interesting like it, there's not a ton that happens in this movie there is actual plot which you know is, is good to see for for a movie like this but um just like any interaction with matt damon and robin williams i eat that shit up so i'm pretty high in this movie i'm sure you guys are as well but i'm a fan yeah, I, I, I pretty much echo everything you said. The quotability, the the dialogue, maybe to a fault to where it's like every single person in this movie is so charismatic and so funny and always says like the the perfect thing that is like maybe it's it's too perfect to an extent, but uh it's still a ton of fun and like I said, it's extremely rewatchable. Um and, and just fantastic acting performances. You you have Matt Damon and Ben Affleck who at the time were pretty unknown people they've been in a, yeah. you know they've been in a few movies you know ben more specifically but i mean it what matt damon and, and robin williams do in this movie is is some of the best like duo performance acting that i i think i've seen in any movie at all and obviously robin williams is, is an all-time great but to have a young guy like matt damon come in and hold his own against somebody like rod robin williams is extremely impressive and then you see you know casey and ben you know shining through in, in their early years and and obviously stellan skarsgård's there as well mini driver like it, it's it's a fantastic cast top to bottom and it's just an all-time classic. It's it, I would say it's also probably in my top ten favorite of all time as well. So don't forget uh Cole Hauser. He's the star of Yellowstone now. That everybody loves that show. My mom does. So yeah. Is that it's, his other friend? Uh, I never knew that guy's name. Billy. Is that his name? I can't remember his name. But the actor's name is Cole Hauser. Okay, he's in Yellowstone. I I can recognize him. I didn't look up his IMDb, but funny Yellowstone. I wouldn't guess. It's a good call. He's the one that says that. It's a good call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tough. Jake, any other initial yeah. thoughts? Do do you do you guys think that Skylar took him back at the end when he like drove to Stanford? She did what? What do you ask? Do you think she took him back? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Dude, when, oh, when like no. when he just like called her, she was like, Oh, I love you. <laughs> like, it was just like a random phone call and she's still trying to get with it. Yeah, I think I think he's got it in the bag pretty easily. It's true love, man. Soulmates. So, so what if what if he's at some bar in Stanford and somebody hits on his grill? You think he just doesn't beat the shit out of him? <laughs> well, good. I mean, that's that's part of their relationship, isn't it? I don't know. He had his transformative moment, though, Jake. He's healed. He did. He did. I he's guess. still from Southie. I don't know. Yeah, I think he whoops his ass. I, uh, I think <laughs> I think they're fine. Let's just see who he is. I mean, Let's hope maybe he takes the high road. But yeah, of course she takes him back. What, what are you talking about, Jake? After watching it last night, it made me realize how much I actually do miss Robin Williams. That dude was insane in this movie. I don't, yeah. I don't think there's another actor that could have done as good as he did in that role. Yeah, I think it's a, it, his performance, which we'll probably talk about later, is, is a really perfect mix of the hardened, like, you know, a little bit of the Southie Boston thing, but then also the intellectual ability that you need to, you know, spar with Matt Damon, as well as just that comedy and that, you know, that bright, beautiful soul. So Robin Williams is a great pick for this. RIP. Let's uh, move on to roll credits. Roll credits. I'll, uh, I'll get it started here and then we'll throw it over to you guys. Um, you know, first thing you gotta, which this is definitely not the first movie that 
we've talked about that has this uh but this is a harvey weinstein production it's it's a miramax film it's it's kind of tough in hindsight to look at and i think it really stands out with this movie because harvey weinstein had a pretty big role in the production of it he was really there with matt and ben making this happen and which in hindsight is probably the worst thing about this movie that's kind of tarnished by that legacy a little bit you know you can you can do the whole separate the art from the artist thing but uh harvey weinstein is obviously a, a terrible horrible person and it's <laughs> it's unfortunate when you're watching a movie to see like it's a ton of, i mean if you, every tarantino movie pre you know 2016 or whatever is is the same thing weinstein company so um you know not a good guy not a great way to start a movie with an opening credit but getting into that, I do like kind of the opening credits. They're pretty quick. You get all the Battle. names pop up over the the math and the papers, and the, then we get into the movie. In comparison, it's not the longest opening credit scene. Uh, I think Top Guns were were much longer last week. Um, and then as the movie ends, you get the car driving off, which also has the credits playing over it, which I think is just like this most the most beautiful image of this car like driving off to California with the trees around it and it's it's just on the open road and the, and the credits you know slowly roll over top of them uh i do want to talk about that like first scene which is beyond the fact you see matt sitting in the house but then you you get there ben's knocking on the door he's he's coming to get him to to go to work or to pick him up or whatever and then about halfway through the movie you get the same thing about 51 minutes in he he knocks on the door he comes out um and then finally at the end of the movie we have the whole interaction he says you know, I, every day I, I hope that you're not going to answer the door. And then finally, at the end of the movie, he knocks, he never answers. And then we cut to him driving away, which is, you know, that perfect wrapping up of the beginning and the end altogether. I completely agree about the ending. I want to touch on a few things you said there, but um, it, it's one of my favorite endings of all time. And I'll definitely talk about it more later on. But especially that Ben scene where he's just like staying outside, I think is immaculate stuff. But uh, yeah. Uh, off the bat here, you know, a little Weinstein production is Junior's favorite film. Can't say I'm surprised. Um, and then as well, to, uh, to jump back into the, the intro there, I think it's boring as shit. I don't know um, really what you're even trying to say here, Corbino. It, it's like a, what are those things called? Like a, It's not like a stethoscope. That's like a <laughs> medical device, right? But help me out here, guys. What's that thing where you look at it? It's like all the weird shit. A microscope. <laughs> No, you don't. It's like a toy as a kid. You look into it, it's got like... Kaleidoscope? Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope. Thank you, Junior. This is why this guy's on the show. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that, but the music, it, I like the music a lot at the end. At the beginning, it's kind of like, eh, this cheesy stuff. I'm not, I don't know if like I'm into this yet. But yeah, the Kaleidoscope bullshit, you know, it, it is what it is. It's, it's in every movie, but at least in like Top Gun, like you said, they got fucking fighter jets going, bro. That I can watch for 10 minutes. I don't want to watch, you know, Matt Damon looking at math for, for 10 minutes in, in a kaleidoscope. But I do like the the ending credits a lot as well. Like you were saying, the car is a very cool shot, very good song choice as well. And I think it wraps up the movie perfectly. But yeah, a lot of stuff there. Junior, yeah. take it away, kid. I wanted, I wanted to uh, talk about the music as well, Cody. Elliot Smith, this will move not only the closing credits, but the whole movie has a good soundtrack. It fits the vibe. Uh, also, you need to grow up. Uh, Matt Damon looking at math is amazing. So <laughs> there's that. That car, I know he says it's a good car, but do you really think it's going to make it all the way to California? <laughs> That's a good question, actually. That engine looked a little sus. Yeah, it did. They, but they built it themselves, man. They did. They did build it themselves. But, uh, I agree. This is the perfect, about as perfect of an ending as you can have. It's one of the reasons I love the movie so much, but. Yeah, uh, my favorite part about the credits is probably the, the song choice that they use. The other thing I wanted to mention, let's talk about the name. Yeah, I want to talk about that as well. Good Goodwill Hunting. Good name, bad name. What do we think, Cody? I, I mean, I like it, obviously, but it doesn't really make sense, I don't think. Maybe, again, you guys can explain this to me, but, you know, he just wants to be a Goodwill Hunting. I think it's cool. It sounds cool, obviously, but does it really make sense? I'd probably say definitely not. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of torn on it because I like the way it sounds <laughs> and it fits so well, but it's like, it doesn't actually make sense. Well, it's obviously, it's a little on the nose when you think about yeah. it. It's like, well, you can interpret it a few different ways. You could be like, good. Who's good? Will hunting. Uh, you could say, you know, 
goodwill and you're hunting, you're hunting for the goodwill mm -hmm. uh, inside you. But first of all, someone being named Will Hunt, like the, the whole thing that it's his name is Will Hunting. Like, I don't, that's a dumb name. <laughs> and it's like, he's only named that for the sake of the title. It's not like, I don't know. I Obviously it's happened. It's just not my favorite thing. I don't know what you do call this movie. It, it's punny. It's clever, but I think maybe it's too clever uh, to be nitpicky, I guess, about it. Personally, I disagree. I may be biased, but I think it's a great title. I don't care if it's too on the nose. That's what I like about it. <laughs> It's a great double entendre. I think it's stupid. I mean, uh, like Corbin said, he could have been named anything. Why, why is his last name Hunting? That's that's dumb as shit. But he's also an I mean, orphan. It, it, so even is that it, his last name? Somebody probably just gave it to him. So they're like, oh, this is, this is a cool pun. But... Will Hunting. <laughs> <laughs> he they gave it to title. himself. He gave himself his last name? You're full of shit. Yes, he wrote the movie, Cody. <laughs> okay. well, well, yes. But I was talking about his character, but fair enough. We got it. <laughs> stupid title that's, the other that's, uh, the other thing i do like is when they're they we have that opening scene where ben and matt first meet each other and they walk out of the house popping up over top of them as they walk out as written by matt damon and ben affleck which is cool to just kind of yeah. see you know you're in your own movie you're starring in it you get the the written by the, the first time we meet your characters is you know good for them shout out to, shout out to matt damon and ben affleck. they deserve like that oscar they did deserve the Oscar, and we'll we'll talk about it here shortly. But let's let's rag on the movie a little bit. Stupidest part. You stupid. They're not. Jake, I'm gonna make you go first because it's your favorite uh, movie. What's the stupidest part of it? It's not necessarily stupid because I think it's kind of realistic. But the part that just makes me the most uncomfortable is Professor Lambo is a really creepy guy <laughs> hitting yeah. on his students all the time. That's weird. And then uh, one other thing. Just a little nitpick, but after the uh, the Harvard bar scene, when Will you know, schools the Michael Michael Bolton clone, and they're walking down the street, and uh, Casey Affleck's character just randomly turns his head 180 degrees and sees him in a window of some diner. I don't know if that would actually happen. I was kind of kind of dumb, but it leads up to a good line, so I'll, I'll forget it. But yeah, it's all about the setup. Cody, what do you got? It's pretty nitpicky stuff from Junior. They're expecting more. Um... I mean, yeah, this is a hard one to pick at. I think it is a pretty tight script, obviously. I did have a couple things. My first one may be very nitpicky as well, I'm not going to lie. So the scene where he goes out in the rain to uh, to call many drivers. Visually, I think that that's a very cool scene. But, I mean, story-wise, it seems a little unnecessary to me. He kind of, like, you know, sacrificed himself in a way to go out into the fucking pouring rain just to call this girl and then when she answers, not say anything. I get it's a character moment, you know, whatever he, he's, you know, trying to grow up and, you know, not be afraid to get attached to people or whatever. But, you know, when it's pouring out, I'd probably just say, you know, wait a couple hours and then do that. Um, again, nitpicky. But my other one, which I do kind of have an issue with, uh, is the amount of mini driver crying scenes. Uh, I think we got at least three. I could be counting wrong here. But it seems like, you know, the last uh, like half of the movie – just every scene with her, she starts crying. You know, it is what it is. They're going through some emotional stuff, soulmates, whatever. But, you know, I think at, at a point, it's like, okay, this is too much. Also, many Driver's not the best crier, if I'm being honest, but I think does hinder her, her performance where she's not on this level with, like, uh, you know, Matt Damon, Robin Williams. I don't know. Again, could be super nitpicky, but it's kind of just like enough's enough at that point. I, I agree though. I mean, the, you like like we said, we're being nitpicky. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna say him sending uh, Affleck's character to the job interview is just kind of a dumb like why he just did it. I get like again, it's just like for the joke, but like just don't go if you don't, because it's not like you actually expected him to do anything. It was just to be a jackass and be funny. Uh, so maybe not a great move. You gotta uh, spike it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It's a great scene, which is the, the, the thing about it. It's one of my favorite scenes, like for an individual moment. So I, I can kind of, you know, allow it to happen. He doesn't tell her he loves her, which like, obviously that's the whole emotional crux. He has to go and talk it, talk to Robin Williams and he has to have his breakthrough and it's not your fault to then go after the girl. But come on, bro. Just say it. Just say you love her. Ah, and then she runs off to co 
California without you. And it's so sad. And you could have just prevented it. And then the other stupid part is, is just Will Hunting is a dumb name. Bringing it back to that. We got to throw that in there. It's, uh, it's pretty dumb. That is, that is a pretty dumb last name. I, I got to admit. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't admit it last rap. <laughs> the last category we talked about, you idiot. Yeah, um, well. But yeah, I mean, this this might be one of our weaker. Uh, we're really pulling. Seconds. Yeah, we're not. We didn't really have anything sound there. I don't think through three of us. So, good good job, uh, Matt and Ben. Proud of you. A, t- a testament to how good this movie is. Yeah. Now let's go to favorite scene. She is very gorgeous to me. Which I think will be a little bit uh, more interesting to talk about. Uh, I have a ton of things that just really stand out, and it's it's hard to pick just one. If we're going for like a mini driver Matt Damon scene, honestly, I really like the scene where they're laying in bed together and she's like talking about being really tall and playing in the NBA because it's not like super crucial to the plot, but it's just like really good character development and a good way to show their relationship growing. Um, and then you still you have that question of like, well, I want to go see, you know, your family. So so, so it is important to the plot, uh, but I just think it's it's really fun. The chemistry there is fantastic. I'll throw it over to you, one of you guys for the next one. Um, my favorite scene is uh, when Will and Sean are in the park. I think it's their second meeting. And Sean just kind of monologues about the how the bench, uh, the bench has no real, real life experience. And he doesn't actually know what he's talking about other than what he's read. Um, personally, this is, this might be my favorite dialogue of any scene in any movie I've ever watched. I know that's kind of nuts, but the dialogue in it, the acting in it is just incredible. And it's, one of my all-time favorite scenes in any film yeah i also had the bench monologue as one of my favorites it's written into the script it's really amazing writing but also there wasn't a ton of direction and robin williams made it his own thing with the inflection and how's he how's he going to tell the story and it's it's really powerful stuff and i think it's one that is like if you're going to go back and just like watch a scene in this movie for some like inspirational you know go out there and live your life this is probably the one you can go back and like identify yeah no and, and to bounce off that that was my first pick as well i i kind of um want to combine their first two uh, meetings almost together because i think uh their first meeting it, it also it's just a, such great acting from both of them you know obviously uh matt's doing the shtick where he tries to get out of their skin it works robin chokes him out i love that and then straight into the next one where he, you don't know me you don't even know yourself you don't know anything and it kind of just shuts down the whole shit. So love that. That's just powerful, powerful stuff, I think. But um, to throw it over to another one as well, uh, more showcasing uh, Matt Damon here. Uh, it's also a cliche. I wouldn't be surprised if you guys would guess this is my favorite scene. But uh, it's him at the Harvard bar telling <laughs> Michael Bolton he's a piece of shit, basically. Just rattling off all the history stuff. And uh, he's got him exactly where he wants him the entire time. I think he even lets him rebuttal a little bit, just to throw him in the dumpster even farther. But um, love that stuff. Uh, any sort of like extreme dialogue like that, where the actor, like obviously Matt, he had to go into some deep stuff there. Obviously, they're probably feeding him lines and everything. But I always just think that's super fun. And, and that's one that definitely stands out to me, like dialogue wise. To go back to the uh, first two meetings, the one in the, in the actual room and the one on the bench, mm. uh, you mentioned that. Uh, Will was getting under his skin and stuff. And then on the bench, I think a really important one line to the plot is Sean saying, you really got to me, but then I went to sleep and I haven't thought about you a second since. I think that's really important, just kind of taking the power back from Will. But uh, that line doesn't get talked about enough as part of the plot point. I mentioned the Ben Affleck getting his the job interview scene as being great as well. Just because Ben Affleck doing Ben Affleck in that moment, he's allegedly your situation for you would be concurrently improved if I had $200 in my back pocket right now. And then let me tell you something, you're suspect, just fantastic, hilarious stuff. Just having a ton of fun in like a pretty serious movie. Part, wasn't it? The fact that he sent him, but that I said is also one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> that makes no sense, bro. You can't do that. You can't pick it for both. I said it before. I think the only other time we've ever done that, I think I picked somebody for best actor and worst actor. You had a fit. So that's a blow. <laughs> no, I said the fact that he sends him is dumb, but it's one of my favorite no. scenes. You got to pick one, bro. One of the, uh, one of, another one of my favorites was <laughs> when 
Matt and Skylar were at her uh, sorority house in the room and uh, they start fighting and Skylar just says, I love you, I love you. Starts bawling her eyes out and says, you know, I want to help you. And Will goes into his child abuse trauma. I think that's a really important part of the character development where it just shows how much Will self-sabotages and how much it actually hurts him even though like he knows that she loves him, but he just can't say it back. He just doesn't think he's like, we're like, like the person being a wallflower says we accept the love we think we deserve. And he doesn't right. think he deserves it. Another great fucking movie, but um, yeah, more, I, more I, many I, driver crying. Like Cody said, <laughs> yeah, exactly. mm-hmm. that, that is probably the best many driver crying to be fair. For, if it's actually like, you know, that, that sort of character development, it, that one's I think important, but once you keep going, it's like whatever. But that is a great scene as well. Uh, I did want to shout out the ending again one final time. Um, again, I, I talk about this all the time, but TV, movies, it's one of the hardest things to do, I think, is have a great ending. We need to get a counter on that. How many times I've said that, Gordon? But um, I mean, this is a ma- just such a good ending in my book. Um, you know, just the relationship between Robin Williams and, and Matt Damon, you feel that. It's it's so weird how strong their relationship is. And then it is a little predictable. You're like, obviously, he's going to go after the girl after talking with Robin that final time. But that line of, uh, well, the, the line of that son of a bitch stole my line, fucking great. And the credits are so great as well. I, I watch most of them every, every single time I watch it. The only other thing that I want to shout out is specific lines first of all the airplane joke is a classic you know that gets passed along so much uh the drunk uncle story that ben affleck tells at dinner and then the story that mini driver tells right after (laughs) (laughs) and then of course just the how you like them apple specific moment like those jokes and those written into the script things are so fun um and and it's kind of what makes it rewatching so enjoyable it's because like every time it's still funny and it's like maybe you forget about one part it's like oh you can always be surprised and and have a good laugh moving on to let's talk filmmaking we are full sail university we take dreams serious jake cody where did you guys have anything for this today um the one thing i would say is the scene when it's matt and ben on the car towards the end when ben is talking about how he every morning he goes to his house and he hopes he's not there just the the camera angles during that dialogue where it doesn't show the person that's talking but it shows the person that's listening and they're how they're reacting to what they're saying and stuff i think that's really good and it's one of, it's another one of my favorite scenes about every movie every scene in this movie is one of my favorite scenes but just the the camera shots in that scene is really great i think yeah i back that i didn't bring too much this week i'm being honest I thought, it, you know, it's not the most interestingly shot movie, but it doesn't need to be at all. I mean, the majority of it, the majority of it, excuse me, is uh, mostly just like people having, you know, conversations. But, yeah, you know, I think the one creative thing that maybe stood out a little bit to me was the, the zoom in on the painting. It's sort of, you like kind of get Robin Williams talking about um, his emotions with the painting as well. And you kind of feel yourself like in it a little bit which I thought that was cool how they did that. But yeah, you know, I left most of it to the professor this week. So let's see what he's got to say. Yeah, you know, there's not a ton stylistically in terms of like the director really going out and making huge choices that are super noticeable. Uh, there's a lot of really subtle things like Jake talked about with the dialogue and the way things are cut together and being able to see the emotion play off people. And probably the scene with Cody and the painting is the most, you know, prevalent example of them actually doing something filmmaking wise uh you gotta talk about the writing when you talk about this movie it won the award for best original screenplay if you've never listened to the oscar speech of matt damon and ben affleck it is an all-time acceptance speech a ton of fun it's kind of like they win this award and it's like these guys are going to be a part of hollywood for the next 30 years and now here we are almost 30 years later and they still are two huge names in Hollywood and have won Oscars since then. Um, but when you look at the writing, I mean, it was just these two young guys. It's very similar to Bridesmaids last week when we were talking about it, Cody, or, or whenever we were talking about Bridesmaids. Um, the script is is very formulaic. It's, it's very simple. It's to the point. It's straightforward. 
it's you could take the beat sheet of a class 100 classic films and it's very similar you get that opening image that closes nice with the final image you have a good strong setup you understand the theme very early on then you have that moment where he gets arrested by the cops which people can identify as like the catalyst moment to then you know bring us into the movie then the professor you know okay what's going on then the big break into the second act is the professor finds him you know scribbling on the wall and they follow him then we get the relationship story that comes in the b story you know you get him and mini driver and then they have fun and they go out on a date and then there's also them at like the carnival which is like the fun part of the script and then you get into the whole <clears throat> actual therapy of it all which is you know the good ch chunk of the second act you know you have those meetings between the two. Now he needs to get a job, which is kind of like the bad guys. He, he's being forced into this corner. Oh, he has to get a job. He has to succeed in the world. And then he has the basically the breaking point that like everything is lost when, you know, he loses his girl. He has the big fight with Lam Lambo, um, you know, and he's just sitting out in the city, sitting on the park bench and he's all a sad boy. And then, of course, um you know he has to have the moment where he reconciles with himself and he reconciles with robin williams and then we get into he gets to then make the decision to leave and go after skyler and we get the same closing image at the end so it's very much like clear cut story structure but the dialogue is so well written the story itself is so great um, and that's what makes it special. You know, it's 122 pages typically a page a minute this movie is like 126 minutes it's there's nothing insane or extraordinary or, or outside the box or something that anybody else couldn't do but at the same time nobody else could right there's something inspirational about it where it's like these two young guys write the story it's a very simple story but it's also like unachievable because of how great it is and i don't know i just i really admire the writing in here i think the writing is obviously the main thing to talk about this movie we've been talking about it a lot but i mean like i said it is formulaic but i think that's what makes it good in a sense uh it, it's a classic story and it's something that's been replicated in the past. It's something that had been done already, but I mean, you matched this up with any other, you know, so, sort of the same cliches. I think this movie wins like 99 out of 100 times. So that's just how good it is, I think, writing wise. And I think part of the, what makes that ending so great that you love so much is because there's kind of two big callbacks. The first one being, like you said, you love that line. Oh, he's, son of a bitch stole my line, which yeah. is a callback to earlier in the movie when Robin Williams yeah. says it. And then there's also the callback of him at the house. So the, the ending wraps up everything perfectly in the way there's there's no unanswered questions, really, um, yeah. which is what makes it great. Other than would the car make it to Cali? But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's hit weird movie details trivia. Naked grandma. Neck, huh? I have two questions this week. I have two as well. I have two as well. I, right. I think I should start off here because uh, okay. mine have absolutely nothing to do with this movie, which is right on pace for me. Mine but sucks, so. I'm actually pretty happy with mine. Uh, my first one, I'm going to bring up a man who we've not mentioned yet, who is a key contributor to this movie, Mr. Stellan Skarsgård. Great actor. Um, my question again, nothing to do with this movie. What is Stellan Skarsgård's character's name in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Junior, we're throwing it to you first. It's Doctor Something. I don't know. <laughs> he knows Natalie Portman. He does know Natalie Portman. <laughs> All right, no multiple choice here. That's been too easy. Corbido, let's say <laughs> you know it or not. No, I don't. I don't know. Oh, I haven't seen goodness. Thor in like six years. Who knows? I don't know. What's his well, name? Well, that was supposed to be the softball. It's a uh, Jorgensen. Doctor Eric Selvig. Selvig. Yeah, that's it. He got taken over by Loki in the Avengers too. Great guy. But uh, yeah, not a good start from you guys. Junior, you want to give us your questions? Or question, excuse me, whatever. So the story when Sean tells Will about when he met his wife, you know, the line, mm -hmm. <clears throat> had to see about a girl. He's talking about uh, the Red Sox game six mm -hmm. when Pudge Fist gets the walk-off home run. So it's kind of a two-parter, but um, who were the Red Sox playing in that game and did they win the World Series? Hmm. Interesting question. I was going to look this up because I was going to make a uh, Carlton Fisk question about about the White Sox because he's on the White Sox too. But I didn't look up who they were playing. Corbin, you got any thoughts here? I, I got to think about this one. Well, uh, I don't. 
as soon as he started reading the question, I was like, oh, he's going to ask who they're playing, and I have no idea. So it was the World Series. It's somebody in the NL. Right, yeah. It was good Um, in, what, like the 80s? So maybe maybe like the the Reds? Are they good in the 80s? Yeah. I'm going to say they didn't win, though. I feel like – I feel like this question is set up to they shouldn't win. When did the whole between the legs thing happen? And that was like the last – yeah, when was that? That had to be a different series, surely. But I'm saying if it was before, they didn't wasn't that like the they haven't won they didn't win until 2004 after that, right? Well, that's like, true. The fucking Red Sox didn't win the World Series before yeah. like fucking 1901. Okay, so they didn't win the series. Good work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was the cur- it was it was literally the curse of the Bambino. They traded away Babe yeah, and yeah. they didn't win again. So, yeah. yeah, I know baseball junior. Why? <laughs> uh, that's I what I'm saying. They were they playing the Mets? Because that I believe that was the Bill Buckner series. But no, because Bill Buckner was game six as well. When okay, it went so out then the that was before game. that. That was earlier then. So who would they have lost to in game seven? I'm thinking the Reds. That's that's just my random guess. Any other good National League teams from the 80s? Maybe like the A's? That makes sense. Uh, it, I, I'm just going to guess both. It, I'm guessing <laughs> the A's and the Reds. If it's one of those, like I get a point. And I'm going to guess two different teams. <laughs> it's not the Mets, but uh, I'll guess the Braves. Wait, are the A's in the AL? But they switched. Fuck. Okay, I'm not. I don't know baseball. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess the Braves and the oh. Pirates. Cody, what were your guesses? Well, I feel like if I switch from the A's, <laughs> the A's I'll pick. Uh, I'll just go with the Reds, dude, whatever. It was the Reds, but it was not the 80s. It was 75. Yeah. Yeah, same difference. They won 75, 76. There you go. I told you I knew baseball all day. Yeah. That, well, who would have beat them in the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> we should have known Cody would, or, uh, that Jake would ask that question. He's a fucking Red Sox. Exactly. Yeah. All right. He's a Red Sox, dude. Many Driver's character was named after Matt Damon's real-life girlfriend, Skyler satan steen unfortunately for matt she left him for a drummer of a rock band what band was it yeah choices yeah megadeth there you go iron maiden acdc metallica well iron maiden. okay he seems pretty confident um i'm not a big rock guy is junior a rock guy i feel like he kind of is I would copy him, but I think he's wrong. Uh, read me those options again. It's not A. And it's not whatever he said. Megadeth, Iron Maiden, ACDC, Metallica. ACDC, Metallica. That's a coin toss. I'll go Metallica. It is Metallica. <laughs> Lars yeah. Ulrich. He also he also uh, dated Mini Driver. Fun fact. Yeah, but she left him, and then him and Mini Driver were – into each other on the set. So. Why do you know that, but you don't know what band he's on? I don't know. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, moving swiftly on. No, uh, he's saying Matt Damon also dated me. Oh, Driver. okay. I thought you were talking about that drummer guy. My bad, Junior. Okay, uh, my second question. It is ma- <laughs> it's, in, it's in main co- conglomeration with my first one. So we talked about Stellan Skarsgård in the MCU. How about my boy Bill? Give me Bill Skarsgård. <laughs> what was the name of his character in The Eternals? I want to hear you guys come up with this bullshit. <laughs> I don't remember Bill Skarsgård being in The Eternals. Jake doesn't even know who he plays. He plays the, 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 he plays the deviant. Yeah. Who, uh, I at least Angelina Jolie kills. I, I should get a point for that because I knew he played him. Um, Tell me his name. It's something really stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm, I don't know, Cody. Just what? say a random phrase. It's three letters. Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Any guesses from Junior? Nothing? No. You guys are no fun. Uh, it's Crow. K-R-O. Which wow. I thought was a great name. You know, it's kind of like the bird. But uh, Bill Skarsgård, get a better role in the MCU. I, I think it's still coming. But I love that trick. Jake, what do you got for us? <laughs> Um, the the Michael Bolton clone. What was his name? Like the actor name or the character name? No, the character's name. 
You're just looking for first name here? Mm-hmm. Clark. <laughs> Clark. <laughs> How come you pull out Clark for his question? You can't come out with anything from mine. Uh, I'll go Billy. His name is Clark. That's how. It is Clark. <laughs> it is Clark. <laughs> All right, good guess. Oh, it wasn't Billy. a guess. I knew it. <laughs> when do they say his name in the movie? I don't know, but I says, Clark, why don't you go away? Uh, I have him written down because I'm going to talk about him later. So. Oh, okay, I was going to say, if you actually remember that, it's pretty impressive. But... Matt remember. Damon himself, a former Harvard student, was planning on making the character a blank prodigy instead of Matt. After talking with Harvard professor Sheldon Glashow, he made, the cha- made him change it to math because it made more sense. Glashow sent him to his brother-in-law, Daniel Kleitman, who is an MIT mathematics professor. What was the original subject that he was going to be a prodigy in? Was it A, chemistry, B, biology, C, physics, D, history? I'm going to go, I'm going to go history. I feel like that's very wrong. That would be my last guess. Um, I, feel like I don't know how you, I don't know how you could be a history prodigy. <laughs> oh. I feel like physics. <laughs> you know sense. all the history before you read it. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, he is a history prodigy already, basically. Yeah, but he just remembers all the history. The math, he's actually like inventing new shit. Right, right. But um, it's definitely nice. I feel like physics makes sense, but there also is some like biology in the movie. So maybe they were just like, you know, I like that idea, so let's incorporate it in a little bit. I- I'm gonna go with physics though. There's also chemistry in the movie. Yeah, shut up, Junior. There's also history. I know. Well, there's <laughs> no tech. there's no physics, but it is physics. So uh well, I mean to be fair, he's kind of a prodigy in everything, I guess, because he I mean he just has a photographic memory. So if he reads it, he knows it. And that could be pretty much anything. But also uh, that professor's name was Sheldon, wasn't it? That's a that's yeah. theory, right? Physics. That's a physics professor. Well, no, his real name is Sheldon. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but it's still funny. Uh, also, <laughs> it's not a big. His name is not a big. His parents didn't name him that. If anything, yeah. Big Bang Theory is a reference to this guy. There you go. Uh, either way, but um, I don't think I missed a question there, boys. That's a that's a clean, weird movie trivia. <gasps> you didn't know Clark's name. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up! All right, none of you guys got any mind. We're right? throwing over a commercial, and we're back. <laughs> Good commercial, Barbie. Who can act? Wow. Cody. Yeah, uh, I mean, the obvious choice here is the late, great Robin Williams. Easily my favorite performance from him. So I won't it too long. Uh, I do have a question for you guys as well. Um, I haven't seen a couple of his better movies, I believe, but do you think this is up there for Ben Affleck's best performance? Mm. <laughs> All right, good response. I think it is. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think, like what? It's Batman, you know. That's not right, better. I, Gone Girl, Gone Girl, no, maybe. It's not that good, really. Uh, I haven't seen Argo. That's that's the big one. I feel like I'm missing, but I think I'd probably vote yes. I, I think he's very good in this movie. Probably has to do with you know he's just acting like himself, which, which is fine. But um, as well, I wanted to throw out Casey Affleck, uh, which we also haven't talked about too much. Uh, his shtick, I think, is is perfect for this movie. Obviously, Boston and everything. But I think he's, like, a little underrated in this movie. The scene that sticks out to me is when he keeps, like, butting in on Ben Affleck's story and he keeps, like, asking questions even though he's heard it, like, ten times. I don't know why, but that, that shit cracks me up. And uh, I think, like, every line he has is is almost, like, a memorable or, or super funny one. So I want to shout him out. Obviously, I'm sure you guys are going to talk about Robin Williams and Matt Damon a lot. But I want to shout out some of the lesser people. My two big ones were Robin Williams and Matt Damon for all the reasons we've talked about in this podcast. They're both nominated. Robin Williams won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, and Matt Damon was nominated and unfortunately lost the Oscar to Jack Nicholson for As Good As It Gets. Uh, But I want to shout out the other Oscar nominee in this cast, and that's Minnie Driver. Uh, I actually do think she's really good, apart from the crying Cody's not a fan of the crying, but I think everything else, I think she's pretty underrated in this film. If you, if you can take her in comparison to the, the, the way we've talked about probably Robin Williams and Matt Damon and Ben and Casey and Stellan Scarriard, I think she's overlooked often. And I think she 
without her, this movie would be uh, severely worse. So shout out to that. Skylar. I disagree. I don't think she's very good, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, obviously, my favorite is Matt Damon. He's my favorite actor ever. Uh, the one thing I would talk about, though, is um, he had uh, frosted tips. And looking back, that doesn't look so good. But but uh, besides from, besides that, I mean, he does a great job acting, actually acting. Um, I actually don't really like Stellan Skarsgård that much in this movie. I don't know what it is. I just don't. He's pretty, he's kind of like the bad guy eventually, but um, I do have a question for you, Junior. What what would you say is like your second favorite Ben Affleck movie? Because I feel like he doesn't have that many good ones. Also, I want to say The Town. That's a good one. I like that one. Yeah. But I, I, think I think Jeremy that... Renner severely. Uh, well, uh, well, yeah. Anyways, go ahead, Junior. He, Jeremy Renner definitely out acts him in The Town. But uh, oh. my second my second favorite Ben Affleck movie besides this one. Well, and Matt Damon. Did I say Ben Affleck? I meant to say Matt Damon. I'm sorry. <laughs> you said Ben Affleck. Oh, no. Fuck Ben Affleck. Give me Matt Damon. This is your guy. My, my second favorite Matt Damon. This is tough. This is real tough. Let's see. Yeah. I really love The Martian. I think he's great in The Martian. But uh, I think his second best performance is in uh, The Talented Mr. Ripley, which came out in 98, I think. Uh, that also has a loaded cast as Gwyneth Paltrow, Jude Law, Philip Seymour Hoffman. That's a really, really underrated movie. I think he's great in it. That's probably my yeah, second I mean, favorite Matt Damon movie. You had me until he said Gwyneth Paltrow, but yeah. <laughs> the town, dude, Jeremy Renner's fucking insane. Go watch that too. But yeah, I, I would probably agree. The Martian is performance wise, I think, probably one of his better ones too. There's also The Departed, which is obviously amazing. <laughs> and, and I think Rounders is also Rounders there. too, yeah. Yeah. So. That's why he, that's why he's my favorite man. He's got he's got Google <laughs> Hunting, Ryan Oceans Hunter, Eleven, Ripley, Oceans Twelve too. Great movie. I do <laughs> I do love I do love The Departed, but damn right. I just think that's just Leo's movie to me. Yeah, Leo just shines too bright in that movie. That's fair. I mean, with him in a a villain role, you don't see that much. Um, so I think that's like a unique performance from him, but. I mean, that is Leo's movie in the end, I think. Have you, uh, hey, Cody, have you seen uh, We Bought a Zoo? <laughs> I haven't. I saw they're making a sequel, I think, though, so I, I might have to check it out before the new one comes out. Downsizing, Cody, that's that's really underrated. Star Joe's in uh, We Bought a Zoo, I think, right? I'm a big yeah, fan of Cody loves Interstellar, the Matt Damon Interstellar performance. Uh, yeah, we don't cool. talk. That's about a that. great performance. But if you if we talk fun. about we talk about Matt Damon, you got to talk about the cameo that is Matt Damon. So you've got him in Deadpool two, you've got him in Interstellar, oh. you got him in Thor Ragnarok. No sudden move. He shows up at the end of, um, basically in a cameo role. Uh, he's really, I mean, true grit. I forgot about that. That's also one of my favorite movies of all time. It's a good one. Haley Steinfeld, Jeff Bridges. Come on. Yeah, and Jeff Bridges. Invict- Invictus, there's a movie. Morgan Freeman. I like yeah. that. Still great water. Wall. Still water. <laughs> Still water. Oh man, I erased that. Still, la- really Still water. Excuse me. Underrated. <laughs> I still haven't seen it. I, I bet it's good. Uh, I'm not watching it. The Last Duel was one of my favorite movies of 2021. That was super underrated. Barely made any say, money at the box office. You might be the only person who's saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, my boy Sean Finnessy got me. He said it was great. So fuck you, Cody. <laughs> let's let's move on. Uh, as everybody talked about who can act, let's let's go to who can't act. That's my opinion. I, I'll start us off again. Why not? I have a Mini great driver. Choice. No, but I am gonna recast her. Who can act? I have a very specific guy. I don't know his name. But I don't really care. It's uh, Stellan Skarsgård's uh, TA. Oh yeah, fuck this that. Guy. That dude's awesome. agreed. Oh my god, his lines are just so dry. But he like takes it to the next level. It's like, dude, we get it. You're not trying. Just get the fuck off my screen, dude. Like, I feel like he's deliberately trying to bring this movie down, and it just pisses me off. But uh, yeah, yeah, it feels like he's like half asleep every time he says a word. And even when he has like a powerful line where he's trying to like talk to Matt Damon about, you know, he's trying to help you find a job, blah blah blah. It's just so boring and and so unnecessary. I think so. That was my obvious one. At least Mini Driver is like she got nominated. She's not bad. I think this guy's pretty bad. So I want to shout him out. He is very bad. And also, uh, I kind of think he I kind of think he wants Professor Lambo, to be honest. <laughs> I think a little bit. Yeah, he's definitely jealous, I think. Tough. There, What's his- there, there is that you know line of what is 
love and jealousy and, and attraction. And, yeah. Uh, not for that. Uh, do you know his actual name, Corbin? Should I look it up? I couldn't find it. Really? <laughs> I struggled. Like, cause I don't, I don't know what his name is in the movie. And okay. the, the guy who played him has been in nothing else. I don't think like he doesn't <laughs> even have a profile picture on IMDb. So I was struggling. Wow. Probably because um, he's so ass in this movie. <laughs> yeah. He, he's not the best, but we'd love to have him on the pod. So if, if he oh, ever yeah. wants to come on and talk. Come on and the, defend yourself. <laughs> he's like on the level of us probably. So. <laughs> <laughs> probably my uh my second one you guys have been calling the michael bolton clone it is clark i don't i don't know who plays him but the douchey harvard guy just a bad performance you know he he's just really playing up the douchey preppy thing but it's it's stiff it's unemotional there's 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 nothing nothing to like there needs need some heart do you even yeah, want this he, girl i don't think so make me believe he doesn't it. he's just showing off but at least at least I won't be serving fast food to me and my family on the way to a skiing trip. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, they didn't give him good lines for a reason. He's supposed to be a prick, but like, I, I think I could have done better. better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, even like with the apple long reaction, he doesn't really even do yeah. anything. He kind of just sits there, like say something, you fucking idiot. But yeah, I agree. Should have fought him. Any other final? Who can't act? I didn't like Mini Driver, but we already talked about that. I agree. I'll get there in a second. All right, the recast. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. Uh, I have a couple recasts, and then at the end of this, I have some like potential casts that we can maybe talk about after as well. Uh, first one, I mean, it's a Boston movie. It's what is it missing? It's missing Mark Wahlberg. Damn right. <laughs> um, you guys maybe you know would wish he'd be in a more prominent role, but I'm not a huge Mark Wahlberg guy, so I want him to play. The guy that they beat the shit out of um at the beginning when when matt damon gets arrested yeah the guy at the the uh the little league game which let's i think we should talk about that scene as well these guys just go and watch little league baseball in their in the south of boston what a life for them good for them uh but then they beat up the shit beat the shit out of that guy and i think it should be mark Wahlberg. that'd be funny get get this in true Mark Wahlberg fashion, how about he plays one of the cops that arrest Matt Damon? I could see it. I could take it. A young, but... Still a bad guy, so either way. <laughs> so, um, I would like to see that. Uh, I highly considered Mark Wahlberg to um, replace the the TA, but I almost I... said that, but I I didn't think it was appropriate. Yeah, it doesn't really fit, especially because you know he's pulling off that accent. I went a little bit different. I went a little bit more cameo ish. And I want Brad Pitt in this role. And uh, I'll tell the you TA what. role? <laughs> the TA role. Okay. It's just like a fun cameo. Because Brad Pitt, he's done like a little cameo stuff in the past. Deadpool 2 uh, is the big one probably. But um, I just want a little bit more energy from this character, obviously. And I think Brad, maybe give me a little, uh, what's that movie called? Line uh, Smoke Burn After Reading? There it is. Uh, give him a little bit of that like weirdo Brad Pitt energy. I don't want the suave guy. I want kind of a weirdo and also maybe a little bit unhinged. So maybe he's like telling uh, Matt Damon, you know, dude, stay the, stay the fuck away. You know, I'm this guy's protege. Fuck you. <laughs> like, fuck like him and Fight Club. You want a little bit. Fight kind Club of, maybe like Fight Club and Burn After Reading together. So a little bit more weirdo. But with a that, with a college education mixed in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> just every, uh, you know, form of Brad Pitt we have, just bring it together a little bit. And I think you nail that. How about uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman in that role? That was actually a pretty good choice. One of the greatest character actors of all time. He, and he can play a shithead. I mean, if you think talented Mr. Yeah. Ripley a little bit, like you would, I, I think that's actually a really great pick. It might be a little too small of a role for him, but yeah. it is a good pick. I think he would be great in it, though, even how small it is. I also wanted to replace the TA. Uh, so coming back to me, and I went with, uh, he's probably a little too young for this, but. Uh, do you guys know Tony Hale? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He plays Buster. That, that's not quite the vibe I want to go for because Buster's a complete idiot. But I want that look of kind of Tony Hale with the glasses and the, the stuffy grad student. And then I think Tony Hale can can play the straight man as well. And I, I think that would be a pretty good uh, fit in the role. So that's what I want to say. I like that as well. I'm not going to lie. I feel like aesthetically that that fits perfectly. But uh yeah, I'd probably take either of you guys' cast over mine, sadly. But uh, 
I do have one more. I'll, I'll save it here. Uh, obviously, I'm replacing Mini Driver, Academy Award nominated, uh, supposedly. And uh, I'm taking this into modern times. So fuck the timeline. I'm bringing in Zazie Beats. And uh, I'll tell you what, I think she's got the chops. We've seen her in, uh, you know, the Joker specifically for like a more serious role. But um, I think... <laughs> I think Zazie Beats basically is just like, she's my new Dave Batista. Um, anytime, you know, I just want somebody cool and just to give off good vibes in the movie, I'm bringing Zazie Beats in. So, you know, I could have brought in Dave to, you know, replace Matt Damon here, but I thought that was a little over the top. So we're throwing in Zazie and uh, I think she'd kill this. She can do the British accent too, if you want her to. Really up to her, you know, actress's choice there, but I think she'd kill that role. My other one was also Mini Driver. Uh, I didn't think about bringing it into modern times, but now that you say that, I have two that I would do. Uh -oh. Back then, back then, the most obvious pick would be Kate Winslet. Yeah. She was in Titanic. I mean, I thought you were going to say Gwyneth Paltrow, which I think it makes more sense. So, no. No, Kate Winslet. But if you're bringing it into modern times, what better than having my favorite actress and my favorite actor in a movie together that's why i'm saying florence Pugh. she is english so she can do the accent <laughs> she'd be great in this movie. yeah i like that as well but um i don't know her and her and matt damon i don't know if they're a great fit but florence Pugh is obviously a great actress and, and she's british so i can't argue with that so now I have some potential casts. I'm going to throw them at you guys. I just want to hear what your thoughts would be. All right. First one uh, was offered, decided to step away from the project. Mel Gibson as director. What do we think? Oh, my God. No. I back it. I don't know. What the hell? Why did they even offer this movie, Tim? Gus I don't Man's know. It. It's a <laughs> uh, I mean, another one. Senior, buddy, buddy. Yeah. I mean, I'm there you go. Person. Another oh. one. Michael Mann. But his condition was he changes them into car thieves and Matt Damon doesn't <laughs> star in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a <laughs> I kind of want to see that now. I'm not gonna lie. I think it probably would have still been a good movie, but it's yeah. nowhere as good. It's completely different. It's yeah, not yeah. the same at all. I like that a lot. But uh basically he was like, uh, Matt Damon these guys are nobodies the studio brought him in to still like do a screen test and he still didn't like them thought they were bad for it so luckily miramax was committed to sticking with them so michael mann was then left the project another one apparently ben stiller offered or it was in talks yeah really i would have liked seeing that too i feel like maybe ben stiller would have made a that one makes the most sense yeah. i think it's a similar movie i agree um, maybe even better than than what Gus Van Sant. I I think Ben I mean, Stiller. Yeah, what, what the hell's Gus Van Sant done since this? Probably not shit. Mm, not a lot. Not a lot. Jerry. Maguire. No, just Jerry. G E R R Y. <laughs> milk. He uh, did movie milk. G E R I got you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, for directors, I mean, obviously it wasn't offered, but I think that if Ben Affleck actually directed this movie, it would have been great. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been his what directorial debut though. Yeah, it would have been. That's the only problem. Maybe like older Ben Affleck directing yeah. this movie would be better, but but his directorial debut is also a great movie. Yeah, but it was like ten years later, right? What's his directorial debut? Or like six years it, later? Gone Baby Gone. It's six years later. Oh, I think it came out yeah. in 03. 07. That is a good movie. Oh seven. So yeah, it was, so it was ten years later. Uh, Leo. Nardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt as Matt and Ben. It would have been good, yeah. but it wouldn't have been as good. Here's the thing. Leo is better at some things, but Matt Damon can do way more than Leo can do. Eh, that's debatable. That's just my personal opinion. That's fair, but uh, I definitely disagree. But um, I think the problem there is the friendship. I think the past friendship is, is super important. You know, sure, Brad Pitt and Leo are, are going to say they're best buds since they're, you know, whatever age, but I, I don't really fucking buy it, if I'm being honest. And uh, also, how good is Brad Pitt's Southie accent? That's my question. 
but I don't, I don't like that too much. I'm being honest. Well, you know, maybe you don't make it a Boston movie. Maybe you, you change it. Who, who knows? Uh, last mean? one. Never say that again. <laughs> last one. <laughs> Morgan Freeman or Robert De Niro to play Sean, to play Robin Williams' character. Those are good choices. I love, I love both of those choices. Those are apparently who they were writing the character in mind with when they were doing it. They would you do it in their voice. They would do a Morgan Freeman impression impression would they would read the line backs to each other or a robert de niro impression i think they both would have fit i think robin williams is a good i think like rob robert de niro is probably too hard too harsh of a guy of a character actor of the, the things he's done in the past robin williams has enough of that good soul heart to him that i think works better morgan freeman would have been really interesting that that would have been a, a very interesting movie i think because i yeah. think he could have done it no i mean uh good for the recast, I was thinking about well, I was thinking about Morgan Freeman as Sean, but I just couldn't bring myself to recast Robin Williams for this performance. Yeah, I, I think Morgan Freeman is is a, a a very great casting, I'd say for this movie. But I mean, Robin Williams is the perfect casting, so I would have loved to see Morgan Freeman do something like this. But I mean, this is a Robin Williams movie. I think it, it's ridiculous his performance. So, but I love Morgan Freeman. Let's move on to our ratings. You're going to look at me and you're going to tell me that I'm wrong? Am I wrong? Cody, take it away. Out of 69, what do you rate this movie? Yeah, you know, I, I had to go back in the vault here. The, uh, what is this podcast? Oh, the Cat Vault. There we go. <laughs> I had to go back in the vault because I didn't want to put this too high compared to some of my other movies. And I went back. My key uh, benchmark that I wanted to look at was the Departed, which is another mm. uh, Boston classic. I believe I rated The Departed a 65 out of 69. So I feel obliged to do the same thing here. because I, I don't think it's higher than that. I, I, I would probably say I like The Departed more in this movie. So I'm going to stick it right in there. 65 out of 69. Boston, stay strong, baby. We, we, we bring it together. But uh, I think Corbin's might be... I feel like you guys both might be a little bit higher. I don't know what to think about Corbin, obviously, but that might be the lowest score. Yeah, my my score is going to be higher. I'm going to go for a 66. Nice. Uh, that actually, for me, I wanted to put this. I I think this is a little bit worse than Moneyball. When I say this is top 10, honestly, this might be like top six for me. Uh, I think this is a little bit below Moneyball, but I gave Moneyball a 66. I'm going to give this a 66, similar to what you did with The Departed. Uh, I don't think it's quite up to the the level above, which is is where I put like Lady Bird and, and stuff like that. So uh, I do enjoy this movie a ton, though. Jake, what are you going to give it for your you favorite movie are, of all time? You already know. It's not even a question. It's it's a sixty nine. There's not another movie that the I very like more first than this movie. The very first. there's not another movie that I have seen more than this movie. There's not one that I like more than this movie. Besides like one or two nitpick things, this movie is literally perfect in my eyes. Do you think you'll ever? This is an interesting thing to ponder. Do you think you'll ever watch a movie that you like more than this one, or do you think this for the rest of your life will be your favorite movie? I don't think I ever will watch one that I like more simply because I was 16 when I watched it and it's been my favorite ever since. So I don't think I will ever get it into my mind that there's a movie I like more than this. Cody, what do you think? Do you think you're, you're still searching for your favorite movie of all time or do you think it's locked? That's a great question. I think that's some deep shit, honestly. I think I probably will see another movie that I like more. I mean, the way filmmaking is going, it, it's completely unpredictable. And I think it's a great era for, for movies, to be honest. But I mean, it, I would probably say Arrival is my favorite movie just because it is like that crazy sci-fi. And, then... and relatively new. That's, I mean, that's a thing. You have a, your favorite movie is a movie that's come out in the last exactly. se seven years. Which I feel like, you know, it could happen again, you know, pretty easily in the next 10 years where a sort of similar vibe movie comes out. I'm like, God, I fucking love that. So, I mean, it's hard to say. Obviously, I think Jake made a good point where it's like he saw it at almost the perfect time in his life, which is very hard to do. So, that makes sense from his perspective who the fuck knows dude? anybody could make anything at any point and i'm be like yeah this is awesome so i'd say probably not for me but i really i respect that a lot from junior surprisingly yeah i don't know i don't know if i'll i'll be able to find something i i think catch me if you can 
it's probably the nostalgia of it more than anything again it's like a, it's a 2000 you know two, 2003 movie uh so it's like old enough to where is it it's n- nothing like it's probably ever going to get made in the same way uh, but there's a lot of great stuff coming out and i'm constantly you know delving back into the endless amounts of film history there are as well i watched the godfather for the first time this week spoiler alert didn't make the new top four but you know <laughs> good film let's move on to we have a pop rhythm. Blockbuster video. Wow, what a difference. Season three. Season three. Also, you need to watch uh, The Godfather Part 2, which I think is, is superior. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll get there. I, I don't have 12 <laughs> hours <laughs> to watch all of them. Skip the third one. Sophia. Come on, Sophia. They have the recut version on Paramount+. Plus. If you guys don't know about We Have Pod Rhythm, I'm going to draw a card. And we each have 30 seconds. Uh, Let me make sure that we haven't talked about this movie, but it's actually really kind of pertinent because the movie is Jurassic Park. And this is fun because uh, I'll get it. Yeah, Jake and I both just watched this movie and I'll I'll get it started. Jurassic Park is another one of my all time favorite movies. I just think dinosaurs are so cool. And that's probably a huge part of it. But I mean, it's Steven Spielberg making, you know, two of the greatest movies in his career in the same year with this and Schindler's list. It's to be at the height of your powers like that is, is truly incredible. Uh, Dinosaurs are cool. Ian Malcolm is a fun character. It's scary. My take is the lost world is actually pretty good as well. So Jesus Christ. I I literally watched this movie. Go ahead. I watched this movie approximately 10 hours ago. So, um, uh, I, I think I saw a tweet about this, but uh, the shot of the dinosaur with all the writing on it, of the Velociraptor, mm-hmm. that shot is incredible. And Steven Spielberg, I need to watch more of him. I just told Corbin this today, but um, yeah, it's a great movie. Five stars. I love it. And Cody? Yeah, I mean, I back most of what you guys are saying. I think it is one of Spielberg's better ones, and obviously he's an all-time director. but uh. I don't think I'm as high on it, obviously, as, as you guys are, or just in the general. I don't know if it's like a classic, you know, maybe like a classic summer blockbuster, but definitely not a classic movie. Also, Spawn, just straight garbage continuously. Lost World, terrible. Jurassic Park 3, Alan. And then Jurassic World is also shit. So I'm not going to see the new one. I have no interest in it. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a good movie from Time. the 90s, but what the fuck is it, Spawn? So, whatever. <laughs> Let's talk recommendations. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. <laughs> Go check out the new Jurassic World Dominion movie. I've heard it's terrible. Uh, I'm the first in the franchise somehow, and they fucking brought back Jeff Goldblum. So what an abomination! Sorry, God. <laughs> Yeah, I, I am gonna go see it, so I, I will so. will say that. Anywho, yeah, my Rex, I'm not a ton this week. I did finish up uh, Moon Knight finally, so <laughs> back on the MCU trade. Uh, the finale, it's okay. I, I kind of liked uh, what's the girl's name? It, it, it it's super forgettable, basically. The, the Golden Scarab or whatever she is now. Yeah, she's cool. I, I like her costume, but um, Oscar is a fun performance. The finale. <laughs> Definitely underwhelming. I, I think it's okay. Series is all probably mid tier Marvel TV, which is, is not saying a bad thing. Layla is her name. Layla. Yeah, I like Layla, but uh, can't remember her name, but I like her. Um, and then as well, I did check out episode one of Miss Marvel. Did you guys watch that? No. Or, yeah, I did. I, I kind of liked it. it. It's super stylistic and it's interesting the direction they're taking it. I'm not exactly sure how her powers work. It seems like uh, do you care if I spoil it a little bit, Corbin? Or, you know? Go ahead, go ahead, go crazy. But basically, I mean, she has this bracelet that gives her powers, unless I'm mistaken, and like she's she bonded with it mystically somehow. But yeah, that's kind of lame. Uh, I think actually give her powers, not just you know she's wearing an Iron Man suit or whatever. So that's kind of dumb. I did like the first episode though, and then um, as well, I actually had uh, a question for you guys about my recommendations. The next thing on the list would likely be Obi Wan. But should I like watch the Mandalorian first or does it not fucking matter? 
It doesn't matter. It does not matter. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm checking out LB1 next. So hopefully next week I'll binge it all the way through. And we can well, yeah. It. If you wait, next Wednesday is the last episode. So, exactly. so uh, I think I'm just going to probably kick out the first three episodes this week and then the next two next week. But yeah. No, yeah, I do. I will say when you finish Obi Wan, you should go watch The Mandalorian because it is genuinely yeah. good. It is on my list. No if kidding. it was like all timeline driven, I would have gone back and just binge a show The Mandalorian. But at this point, I kind of just want to see Obi Wan. So, yeah, and Obi Wan's been pretty good so far. Um, we have a new episode coming out uh, Wednesday, so we'll see episode five. It, I'm curious to see how it really wraps up the story with with where we're at four episodes in. I, I don't know, Jake. What are your thoughts on Obi Wan so far? Um, I really like it so far. The first two episodes were kind of slow. The third episode, obviously, probably everyone's favorite, but uh, the last episode I thought was pretty underrated. And I like the story that they're going with. And I mean, it's pretty nostalgic, but I enjoy watching it. I think it's good. Uh, I won't say anything else because I don't want to spoil it for Cody and we'll, we'll save a further discussion later. Uh, for me, just some things that I've watched, uh, that new Hustle, new Adam Sandler movie on Netflix, actually pretty decent, really cool integration yeah. of uh, real life NBA players into a, a narrative story. It, it's actually pretty cool. Some of them playing themselves and some of them like Anthony Edwards and obviously yeah. Juan Cho Hern Gomez playing real people in the movie, like actual characters. Um, and Anthony Edwards, I mean, everyone knew he's a funny, charismatic guy. Uh, charismatic guy but he he is pretty good in this and uh watch is not too bad either and adam sandler's doing adam sandler it, it, it's a good movie it's a it's a fun philly sports movie and it's a it's a feel good you know if you like basketball you're gonna like this movie at the end of the day uh i also watched happy gilmore for the first time uh yeah. not not too bad actually God, I, I i actually liked it pretty well it it wasn't uh wasn't too bad i i expected to dislike it more like I said, Godfather for the first time, still kind of processing it a little bit. Definitely need to watch part two. Um, but, you know, I wasn't blown away, blown away. You know, I think maybe expectations are too high. Also rewatch Toy Story because it's light year time, baby. And uh, wanted to go back to the roots. And I'll tell you what, Toy Story, also a classic. That movie is also really good. So I've been just watching good movies recently. I need to get back into watching shit movies. Why? because you gotta you, it reminds you how good the good movies really are when, yeah. when you watch something bad i don't really like watching good movies i fucking hate watching bad movies. but happy gilmore that was the best of the bunch right there so i respect <laughs> i would say cody you would like hustle you should definitely watch it yeah my, i saw the anthony edwards scene on twitter and i i thought it was pretty funny so yeah, yeah. no and he's I like, like i mean he's the villain of the movie he's in it he's in a couple <laughs> scenes so really? he, he's acting yeah <laughs> that's awesome i might have to check it out then just for that and and then just the cameos on cameos, it, it's all over the place. So, Jake, what do you got? Yeah, um, I also watched Hustle. I watched it before Corbin, actually, not to not to flex or anything, but I agree, it was pretty good. I didn't have it. I didn't think it was as good as Corbin thought it was, but it was a pretty pretty fun movie. It was a pretty good performance from Sandler. Um. I also, I mentioned uh, Gone Baby Gone earlier, but I just watched that for the first time like a week ago. And I do recommend that. It's a great Casey Affleck performance, a uh, great Ben Affleck movie. Um, I was also going to re recommend Obi-Wan. I've been watching that every Wednesday. Uh, for any Star Wars lovers, you're probably watching it already, but if you aren't, and you should. Um, and then also, this movie hasn't come out yet, but on Friday... Uh, Apple TV Plus, Cha Cha Real Smooth comes out from Cooper Rafe, his second movie. Uh, I think he's only 25 or 26, but his first movie, Shit House, was pretty good. And I'm really looking forward to Cha Cha Real Smooth with Dakota Johnson. Uh, the trailer's on YouTube if you want to watch it, but I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I second that. I think Shit House is a really phenomenal movie, especially for your first movie and being like 23 24 when you made it um writing directing and starring in it it's pretty cool um and i am excited to see this leslie mann dakota johnson and uh an interesting story for uh representation as well for for people with autism so curious to see how it turns out and uh looking forward to it the last thing i uh watched the first season of succession finished the first season of succession and uh yeah 
pretty good. I, I've heard it gets better, so I'm excited to see it really ramp up. Phenomenal score, though. I think I've said it before, but phenomenal score. Any other final thoughts, fellas? I agree. Succession is great, and season three is the best season. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Cody? <laughs> That's all I got. Great great pick, I think, today, and a fun one. We haven't done, like, a uh, – a very good movie in a while, I think. So a good change of pace, uh, an okay guest, but overall, I think a, a pretty good episode. So I had a good time. Oh, and uh, by the way, thanks for having me on. I don't think I said that earlier. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> Appreciate you coming on, Junior. I love you, bud, but uh, you're an idiot. Jake, thanks for coming on. We'll have you back next season to talk uh, 80s movie draft. So, Oh, man. We'll see you then with, with a lot of guests, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, a uh, couple things. Follow us at Cat Podcast on yeah, Twitter, that. TikTok, Instagram. Do it. Follow us. Also, I've decided I'm going to start uploading these on YouTube again. So if you'd rather listen on YouTube, check that out. When it gets to season four, we'll probably do video podcasts again. But for now, uh, check us out on youtube if you want to listen to any old episodes i'm in the process of uploading them and also trying to upload some more stuff on tiktok so be ready for things over there thanks for listening jake thanks for coming thank you Abby. peace what you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things i have ever heard at no point in your rambling incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul.